272, a child of the king. song. I like that song, Brother Tim. Thanks for choosing it. Very good. Let's have our ushers come forward. We'll get ready to receive our offering. And as they're coming forward, let me remind you of a couple of things. First of all, Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And I hope you'll be here for it. I, I trust you will. And uh, I understand family and all that. But look, we're not having an evening service Sunday, so you can be with your family. But uh, don't put your family above the Lord. Uh, Brother Rex, you and I talked before about how uh, you know, saying among preachers and all this stuff too, you know, uh, let me get it right. Uh, blood's thicker than water, right? Blood's thicker than water. I mean, how many of you ever heard that phrase before? Blood's thicker than water? Yeah. Well, I've learned something. My dad raised me this way. Not everybody agrees with this, but I think it's it saved my life a lot of times with my extended family. Uh, when it comes to Christians, the Bible should be thicker than blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think that's true. And so be here Sunday morning and for Sunday school and church, and we'll look forward to a good time. Bring somebody with you. Uh, we are planning on, although Brother Will mentioned to me, <sighs> <laughs> I'm going to quit saying this because I jinxed it or something. I don't know what's happening. But uh, this is the second Saturday in a row we planned on going out to pass out tracks. And there's a 90 plus percent chance of rain on Saturday. And uh, that's more than it was last week. So, um, if it's not raining at about 9 or 9.30, we're going to be here. But if it's raining at 9 or 9.30, I don't want to ruin our tracks and getting wet and 
Everybody else walking through there. It's hard enough walking from your car to in here getting wet, <laughs> let alone being out for an hour or so uh, getting drenched. So, uh, so either way, on your way out, grab some, some invitation cards and some gospel tracks. I'm just looking now. It looks like you're already running low a little bit. Praise the Lord for that. We got plenty. I ordered 10,000 pieces of literature, so we have, we have a few to go around the lessons for a little bit. But uh, grab some of those before you leave, and uh, we'll look forward to that. All right? Well, let's pray and ask God to bless our offering. And as we receive our offering, we'll sing another song. Brother Mayler, if you don't mind, why don't you lead us in prayer, sir? Dear Lord, I thank you for another chance to come to worship you tonight, Lord. I do pray, Father, that you send the Holy Spirit in here to bless us and help us, Lord, to hear the word plainly and clearly. And the Holy Spirit to guide us all the way that we go and that you bless each and every one of us here tonight. Bless the ones that couldn't make it. Let them know that we love them, that we miss them. And Lord, I do pray, Father, that you bless this offering. Use it for your honor and your glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 327, I've been to Calvary. We'll sing the chorus through a couple of times. Number 327.
right, who will be first to have a uh, prayer request tonight? Someone got a special prayer request. Anybody? Yes, Brother Tim. Remember Dean Head, he had surgery this afternoon on his shoulder. Okay. Brother Dale, would you remember that, Brother Tim? I heard. Someone else got a special prayer request. Anybody got a special request? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Joyce Moore had surgery yesterday on her heart, and when they got in there, they found that the tissue around the heart was not strong enough oh. to hold the flip. So they were able to fix her, her the leaky valve. And uh, so we sent her home today, and she's in good spirits, but she just needs prayer. Um, went through all this, and then they said, can't fix it. Yeah, that's right. Brother Charlie, would you remember that young lady? Dear Pastor Phil and Father, we do lift Joyce Moore up to you tonight. We know that she is in pretty bad shape there, and that we know that you are the great healer, and it looks like you are, we have to rely upon you and your will to be able to help her. Just give her peace of mind and uh, give her, let her know that you are there for her, and uh, we are here praying for her. We ask it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Anybody else got a special prayer request? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Um, Lula was telling me Sunday that Mark, he's he's off of chemo and, and the radiation right now, but uh, later on this month, he's going to start back stronger doses of the chemo. And it's going to be really hard. And uh, he's probably going to lose his hair and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, we could pray for him. You need to pray for Brother Mark, and uh, we, he's trying to going to try to come to the uh, uh, supper for the young at heart, and we are, we're hoping that he'll be yeah. able to do that. Bill, would you pray for okay. him? Father, we do lift Brother Mark up to you tonight, and uh, the treatment, the chemo treatment that he's going to receive, and the surgery that he's going to take. It sounds like it's going to be hard on his body, so mm -hmm. I pray that. You would be with him. I pray, Lord, that there will not be any sickness. I pray that the hair loss will be minimal. And uh, that this treatment will go ahead and uh, cure the cancer in his body. I pray for Lula. I pray that you would be with her and give yeah, her peace yeah. uh, that she needs as they go through this. Uh, and give Mark peace that he needs also, yeah, Father. Yeah. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Anyone else got a special prayer request? Anybody real quickly. How about a praise? Anybody got a praise? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to come to change the thing from all my sons. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Anybody else got a praise? Yes, sir, brother. Uh, I'm going to let y'all know that uh, my sister does, does not have cancer. So, uh, I thank God for praying. Amen. Wonderful for that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my granddaughter, uh, the neurosurgeon, called my daughter yesterday, and they have moved up her appointment to this coming Monday instead of May the 24th. Amen. So we should know when and if she's going to need the surgery. Amen. Wonderful. Anybody else got to pray? God, you got something special for you. All right. Well, are you glad to be here tonight? Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right, preacher. Come here, time. Brother X. Oh, there is a lot of time. My goodness. I won't take it all. I don't think my voice will last that long. <clears throat> Let's take our Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. 
we're going to stay there for the most part, but I'll have you turn to a couple of the places here in just a moment. So I encourage you to be ready with that. Proverbs chapter 24. How many of you have ever heard someone use the excuse that they are the way they are because of upbringing or where they're from or background or anything like that? Have you ever heard anything like that? Have you ever yeah. used that excuse yourself? <laughs> Come on now. Don't lie about this. <laughs> Three people, four people raise their hand on that. Yeah, well, I'm glad to know that the God's power is greater than all that. And uh, it can change us for sure. And um, I'm thankful that God's word will do that for us. Well, I want to bring a thought to you. How many of you tend to have a more, what we would call a type A personality, a more uptight Intense personality. Who you have somebody like that? You're like that. Miss Faye, you're like that. I think I am to a degree. I didn't see that. Who? Okay, who's who? Are my friends here, Miss Tina. I got you also. I won't say it. <laughs> Brother Terry, I'm not gonna say it. Yeah, okay, Brother Rex raised his hand. Miss Grace forced him. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then maybe you don't need this message as much as I do. But what I want to show you tonight, um, you know, it's easy, very easy to uh, get really upset with what we see going on in our world. Yeah, yeah that's right. It just is. Proverbs chapter 24. Verse 19. <clears throat> the Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, hmm. neither be thou envious at the wicked, for there shall be no reward to the evil man. It's an interesting phrase. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Amen. Uh, I, I know I don't have to say this, but if you've watched the news at all or anything like that at all with what's going on in our country and our world, especially in our own country right now, wickedness and evil abounds right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Everywhere you go. Not just in our country as in our government, although in our government there are a lot of lies, a lot of injustices going on. A lot of injustices. I would encourage you, and this is not the message, but I would just kind of throw this out to you, that um, what we see happening in our world right now in the legal system, you stay with me on that, okay, I'm not going to get all into it right now because I'll get distracted, but with what's going on in our legal system is paving the way, I promise you it's paving the way to target Christians. Yep. I don't know if you heard about this, but the mayor of New York City came out just a couple days ago. Mayor of New York City, not a very conservative place, but the mayor of New York City came out and said, if you're going to riot what's going on in our city right now, don't come here. And he said this twice. I heard it. We know that if there are riots that come to New York City over what's happening in our legal system right now, we know that it will be instigated by conservative Christians. Huh. Said it twice. said, if you come here to do that, we will put you in jail. I wonder where they were a few years ago. It's laying the groundwork for that. It will happen one day. It will happen. I've often said as persecution comes, there, mediocre Christianity will be extinct. There will not be any mediocrity among Christians at that point. Either you will, you will be willing to suffer and be persecuted, or you're going to just forsake it and for comfort and your own pleasure. Yes. It will. It's going to happen that way. It will. I believe I proved from the, from the Bible. But I believe it's going to happen. We've seen it in other countries before it gets here. Right now, it's at a lower, different level, maybe at work. I know people, even our own church, 
who have shared with me and I have prayed with them about certain things at their jobs. There will be people, maybe they're your coworkers, maybe they're subordinate, maybe they're your uh, bosses, your, your manager, supervisors, whoever, your employer. They try to force you into a mold. You will act this way, you will speak this way, you will think this way, you'll behave like they want you to, or you may lose your job. There have been a couple of people in our church who have faced that very thing since I've been here. At school, the pressures from other students sometimes, and I hate to say this, but even sometimes from staff in schools to make you and to force you to think a certain way. Not make you do certain things, but they'll make you think a certain way. And if they can get the way you think, they have determined how what you will do. Every time. But again, that's another topic for a different time. What I want to talk to you about tonight is fret not thyself. Fret not thyself. Wickedness abounds. That's obvious. We don't need to deal with that too much more. That's, that's a, a, a given. We know that. We also know, and I hope you believe this, I believe you practice it, we're not to join in to that wickedness and that evilness, and uh, we're not to be contaminated with those things. We're not to be contaminated by those things, by those who do wickedly. But here's the question. It's not so much are we going to get into that mess. I believe on a Wednesday night crowd, I hope I can say this safely, you shouldn't be involved in that mess. I believe we should try to lead them to the Lord, but they shouldn't influence you. Right. Don't let it contaminate you. But what about our spirit? What about our attitude towards all the things that go on? I know people, and this has been several years ago, but I know people that, or I should say, I guess I knew people, that watch the 24-hour news cycle so much, they would not leave their house. Literally, they would not leave their house. This is before you get your groceries delivered. This is before you, um, uh, like, DoorDash and Uber Eats and, and those kinds of things. They would not leave their house because they were so upset and fearful and scared and that they were fretful about these things. They were so disturbed. What about our spirit about these things? I can, look, I can get just as upset as anybody else about injustice. And if you believe in justice, then injustice kind of gets your goat. And if you believe in truth, then lies and falsehoods are going to kind of bother you. Right. Can I say this? They should to some degree. I wonder sometimes about some Christians. If I think if they were any more laid back, they'd be dead. Yeah. I mean, it's just, oh, I don't care what happens. It's not affecting me. Hmm. I, I, I have a little bit of a problem with that, but I also have a really big problem with what the Bible says, fret not thyself. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll come back. Hold your place in Proverbs. We're coming right back there in just a second. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter three. I'll get there in a second. Give me a second. Second Timothy three, verse thirteen. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's everybody's life verse right now, right? <laughs> Everybody knows that one. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What's the next word in verse 14? But. But. But is a conjunction. It's the same thing as and, except and means I'm going to continue the thought. But means I'm going to change the thought. I'm going to show you the opposite side of it. But while all these people are getting worse and worse, and while they are deceiving and being deceived, deceived, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It's going to get worse. Now, let me say it this way. We always say, what is this world coming to? I believe this world is coming to Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. One day, they're not going to have a choice. This world will eventually come to Jesus Christ, and he will reign here for a thousand years. 
Right. So that's eventually where it's going to go. Before that, it's going to get worse. Everybody turn around real quick and look outside. Just wave. There you go. Luke is Luke is Luke and Levi sitting there like I know they do. I'm sure they do. <laughs> I love it. They're out there working. That does my heart good. A little distracting, but it does my heart good. It's going to get worse. But I want you to know the Bible still tells us to continue in the things which we've learned and been assured of. It's hard to continue in that way when we're consumed with the evil state of mankind. So I think we need to guard our spirit. And I think that's what the proverb is telling us here. Fret not thyself because of evil men. Look, lost people are going to act like lost people. Saved people are supposed to act like saved people. When lost, excuse me, when Christians expect lost people who don't know the Lord is their Savior, when they expect those people to act like Christians, the only thing you're having in your heart is frustration and anger. Yeah, right. Because they cannot, for very long, act like a Christian. I'm not saying they're moral. I'm talking about they're born again. They can't. I'm not saying they're all mean people. I'm just saying they're not going to act like Christians. They can't. They are spiritually dead. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to be very careful and keep that in mind. When we watch the news and we see what's going on in our country and we see what's going on all around the world and all these things going on, keep in mind, most of those people are not saved. That's right. Most of them aren't. So all you're going to have when you expect them to do more than sin and do better than sin, all you're going to do is get angry and frustrated mm -hmm. because they are bent on sin. They're dead in their trespasses and sin. So the Bible says, fret not thyself because of evil men. Look at the words here for a minute. Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. Those words are used again in verse 20. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall go out. Evil and wicked mentioned two times each in these two verses. Four times we see these words given to us. I want you to know that the wicked man has a reprehensible behavior. They have a reprehensible behavior. It has to, these things, these evil and wicked, these words have to do with the nature of men and the actions of men who are separated from Christ. I mentioned to you before, and I want you to get this in your heart. We have not seen the limit. We have not seen the limit of evil that comes from a sin-blackened heart. Right. That's right. We haven't seen it. Evil has been called good and good has been called evil. Sin has been given center stage with a worldwide microphone. Sin and its behavior has become desensitized, normalized, and proselytized. That's what we're facing. We don't even, most people don't even give a second thought to the commercials on TV anymore. It makes me, excuse me, I'm going to use a biblical term. It makes me want to hurl. <laughs> when I say, my stomach, I just turns. Yeah. It's sick. But what do you expect for people who don't know the Lord? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can get frustrated. I can get so mad. I can get so upset with it. And we, we, we say, well, it's righteous indignation. Not really. Not really. If we really examine our hearts, like the Holy Spirit shows, it's not really, truly, purely righteous indignation. Now, let me say this. Righteous men and women should be bothered by those things. <clears throat> we should. You shouldn't be comfortable with that. You shouldn't be okay with that. We should take a stand on those things. But there's a difference between being bothered and being consumed. There's a difference between being bothered and being consumed. If we are consumed with this wickedness and this evil that everybody else has and how our world's going, if we get consumed with that, we're in danger of harboring resentment. Fret not thyself. Fret not. That's a very soft way of saying this. Don't get yourself fired up and become so fervently grieved 
over something that is natural and predicted. Evil men and seducers are not going to get better and better. We know, we quote it, we read it, they're going to get worse and worse, and then we get upset and shocked when they get worse and worse. Don't fret over that. Truth naturally sets itself against evil and wickedness. And we know the truth. We have the truth. We believe the truth. We preach the truth. We live the truth. So it should naturally set us against that evil and that wickedness that's there. Those who live by the truth will become naturally enraged at what's going on. But the Bible says, fret not thyself. That word fret is that idea of being enraged. It doesn't mean don't worry. It means don't let it burn in your heart so much that it just consumes you. We can kindle our anger. We can burn on the inside because of all the evil that abounds. And it's natural to do that. But did you know that Christians are not called to live a natural life, but a supernatural life? Supernatural. The Holy Spirit is not natural. He is supernatural. And we are to live the Spirit-filled life, walking in the Spirit, yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. So fret not thyself because of these evil men. It says in verse 19 again, uh, neither be thou envious at their work. I've always thought envious meant you know, jealous. Look at what they got. I don't have it. I wish I had it. I'm doing right. Why don't I have what they've got? Envious. Until I started looking at the word and seeing it in the context, it has the idea of this. Envious means zealous, earnest, but in a negative way. We get so concerned. Isn't it interesting? Jesus could flip over tables, make a whip out of cords, and drive out money changers out of the temple and do that two times and then walk away and still preach the gospel of peace. In my flesh, I will tell you this, if I made a whip and I went to some place and I started driving out the drug dealers and kicking over tables in the crack houses and I walked in there doing that, when I walk out, my spirit is not going to be 100% right for the first I was going to say about a week. <laughs> I'll be honest because I'm just oh, fired up. Fired up. It's hard. But Jesus could do it. Be careful thinking that you can do that. Because in our, yeah, remember, you're not the son of God. We have flesh that we struggle with. We deal with those things. Envious has the idea of being so zealous about things, so earnest about those things in such a bad way that, we, look, I know people that are so upset about what's going on in the world, they can't even read their Bible. Well, back up. They read it, but they can't get anything out of it. They're just so upset by it. Verse 1 of chapter 24 says, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. Don't be so fired up about these things. Don't be so discouraged about these things. Look, it is better to fight wickedness with godliness than with infuriated anger. We get so consumed with the bad news and all the wickedness and the sin that abounds. Look, I keep saying the word consume because it has the idea of a fire burning inside of you, consuming you. I'm saying it on purpose, but here's the thing. Do you know why we are consumed with those things? Because Christians are consuming what is being fed to them. Yeah. You do understand that when the media says look over here, you should really be looking over here. Yeah. Right. You do understand when the devil tries to get you distracted over here, you probably should be turned exactly 180 degrees the other way. Right? Yeah. But we consume 
We feed upon what is being pushed upon us and fed to us from the world, and we believe it. There used to be a time when the news media would come on TV and on the radio, and they would report the news. And they would say, now you can decide what you think about it. That no longer exists anywhere. I talked to Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina uh, back in 2021. I was able to fly to Washington, D.C. Uh, with a, a group called Faith Winds, and about 10 of us pastors were able to go up in a great time. Was, we were there for about 18 hours. That was all. It was a quick trip. But I met with Senator Tim Scott. He's the senator from South Carolina. Right. Tim Scott, I was able to talk with him, and somebody asked him, and said, um, how much of the news media is true and how much of it is false? And he said, well, I'll tell you this. He said, he said, conservative Christians are always saying, don't trust anything you hear on the news. He said, that's not true. He said, there is some truth in the media. Otherwise, nobody would believe it. He said, it's about 3%. <laughs> and 97% of it is a lie. Amen. All right. You see, a rat won't eat rat poison if there wasn't some kind of good food in it. But we consume that stuff. Now, don't walk out of here saying, well, the pastor doesn't think we need to be aware of what's going on in our country. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when we let that consume us, what room do you have left in your heart and mind for this book? Isn't it amazing? We do so many things. We allow things to come into our life. We feed ourselves so many things that cause us to grow and, and get fired up in carnal areas of our life instead of getting fired up and growing in the spiritual areas of our life. Now you can fill in the blanks on what those things are because there's the whole gamut of things we could talk about on that. Too many people are consumed by these wicked men and these evil people. But I want you to see verse uh, 20. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Rest assured, they have their reward. They have their reward. You say, well, the Bible says that there is no reward. They have their reward. They do. In other words, they, what, they're, what we're saying is, it's not that they don't have any kind of, it's not talking about just pleasure. They have no future glory, no future reward given to them. The only thing that people in those verses have coming to them, if they do not trust Christ as their Savior, if they don't get saved, the only thing they have is judgment and punishment. That's all. That's all. The only reward that they may have is right here and right now. That's all. That's it. They may have pleasure and finding some college student that's in a, in a public university somewhere, and they find out that this young person is a Christian, and they believe the word of God to be true and inerrant, and they'll, they'll find pleasure in mocking that person and criticizing that person and maybe even dropping their grade because of their belief, and that's their reward. That's it. And it happens. Mm-hmm. I faced it in high school. I failed classes because I believed the word of God and the communist teacher didn't believe it. I said, where were, I was in Poland. Oh, don't breathe too lightly. It's here. It's here. You see, that was a long time ago when that happened to me. I stood up and said I was a Christian. I believe the Bible to be true. And I believe God is real. And they said, sit down, zero. Mm. We were graded on a scale of one to five instead of A, B, C, D, F. We were graded one being the lowest, five being the highest. I got a zero. I wasn't that bad at physics. I was actually pretty good at it. I was pretty good at biology. I was pretty good at chemistry. But I got a zero in those classes because I was a Christian. Mm. I wish it would have been private, but when they stand you up in front of about 50 students in the classroom and mock you and make fun of you, and you have to stand there. At 16 years old, that'll put a little bit of grit in you. Yeah. Yeah. 
they have their reward. I don't take pleasure in that. I don't take joy in that. But when I remember that they have no reward in eternity, that does something to me in my spirit. The only reward they have is right here and right now. And they do not realize that the pleasures of sin only last for a season. Yep. Yep. They live for time, <clears throat> not for eternity. They want what they can get now with no thought of what will be one day. In other words, if I can just say this, they don't have a pleasant ending. The Bible says that the candle of the wicked shall be put out. Now, let me just say this, and then I'm going to get to the grammar of the words here for a second. Some people put their own candle out. Some people put their own candle out. What I'm talking about is this. It doesn't mean, when it says the candle the wicked shall be put out, it doesn't mean that they cease to exist. It means that their future existence is complete and utter darkness. It's talking about their death in this life and the state of eternally dying in the next one. The only pleasure and happiness they'll ever experience is on this earth, and it's for a short time. <coughs> Excuse me. When these people extinguish their own candle, what drives them to do that? They realize that what they've been living for is not worth living for. They realize. That money can't make you happy. I know people who have put out their own candle because they're afraid of getting caught. They're afraid of getting caught. Just recently, not too long ago, I'm forgetting now the time frame, but in the past month, I believe it was, recently anyway, there was a very, very wealthy multi-billionaire that took his own life in our country. Next thing you know, about a week or two or so after he died, his business went under. He knew it was coming. He had done some illegal things and he took his own life because he was afraid of getting caught. He extinguished his own candle. I don't say that with a smile on my face. I've had family members extinguish their own candle. find out that what they're living for is not worth living for. May I say this, whether they snuff out their own candle or God ultimately does it, which here in the words here in verse 20, it says that the candle of the wicked shall be put out. It doesn't mean they do it themselves. It means somebody else is acting upon their candle and coming along going, <sighs> not themselves, somebody else is doing it. It's a passive idea here. It's the voice of it is that somebody's acting upon them doing it. One day, God will ultimately snuff out their candle. And their ending will be one of darkness and emptiness. I don't like this kind of preaching because one of the things I'm afraid of is you're going to walk out of here thinking I've gotten a calloused heart. I'm hard-hearted and don't care about people. That's not the case. Right. But I do know I do know that those who live in sin and completely reject the redemption that is only in Christ Jesus will have their candle snuffed out. And they will spend eternity in darkness and death. I don't like it, but that's their choice. That's their choice. I think about the men who have crucified Christians in the past few years in other countries. I think about the men who pulled the trigger and killed my friend at Baghdad, Iraq. Just not too long ago, last fall. I think about, I think about the, the evilness, the injustice that happens in our own country. I think about right now, just in Lawrenceville, forget Gwinnett County, just in Lawrenceville, 30,000 people or less, just in our little town, right now, at a quarter till eight, behind closed doors, in homes in our town, 
the abuse that's taking place on children. Mm. Mm. I can get pretty fired up about that. Yes, sir. Fret not thyself. Keeping the extinguishing of their candle in view will extinguish the burning zeal and envy and earnestness that often arises in our hearts. I know the end of the evildoers. God tells us what it is. I don't rejoice in it. Look, we spent good money on gospel tracts to give them, have a tool. A gospel tract doesn't save anybody. Jesus saves them. That's just a tool to use to talk with people. I, I want to see that happen. I want to see our church be a, a, such a, I, I want our church to be the greatest soul winning church in this area. But I'm not so ignorant and naive to believe that every person is going to get saved. Some people are so far gone in their reprobate mind that they will not, actually, that's even being too nice, they vehemently uh, reject and spit in the face of God. Mm -hmm. Their candle will be put out. And that helps me understand that I don't need to be the one to try to have vengeance upon them. Right? That's right. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I don't have to have vengeance upon them. Oh, in my flesh... In my flesh, I hear of a, somebody abusing a child or a man hitting a woman or anything like that. And I tell you what, I would love to have about eight seconds with them by myself and knew I wouldn't get in trouble. But you know what? Even that on that spirit going that far is going against fret not thyself. Yeah, that's right. Now, according to your own raised hand and testimony, most of you may not understand that feeling because you don't have that kind of personality. Now, some of you can get fired up just like that over at sin. I get that. But that personality, it's there. But knowing their end will keep that from rising up in our own hearts. Now, keep in mind, this is not ignoring the problem. This is not becoming apathetic uh, towards the world situation. It goes beyond that. Let me show you what we need to do. Look at Matthew chapter 5. And I'll be done after this. <clears throat> Matthew 5, verse 43. This is repeated again in Luke chapter 6. There's a little bit more detail here. Matthew 5, 43. The Bible says, Jesus speaking here, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that, that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? But ye therefore... Excuse me, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So what's the answer to it? When you think back, fret not yourselves, don't be envious of them, knowing these things. What's the answer? I believe the answer to it is God's people experiencing such a great spiritual awakening personally. That we give the gospel out and people get saved. I am anti-abortion and pro-life. Not ashamed of it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Come on. Amen. 
You know what I'd rather do? And I'm not saying this is bad or sinful. I don't think it is bad and sinful, but I'm just saying what I'd rather do. You know what I'd rather do than standing stand in front of a Planned Parenthood with a sign picketing Planned Parenthood? You know what I'd rather do? I'd rather get the Word of God and take a gospel track and go to someone and try to lead them to Christ. I'm for, excuse me, I am against people taking away our God-given rights in this country. I'm against that. But you know what I'd rather do rather than march on Washington, D.C.? I'd rather take the word of God that changes lives and see those people get saved. Because there's some things you can get someone to not do one time. But you get the Holy Spirit living inside of them. You get the word of God planted in them, taking root and taking seed. There's certain things Christians don't do. I'd rather do that. It brings around life change, real life change. But there has to be a spiritual awakening among God's people. We just, you know, we feel safe in our homes. We feel safe in a church. We feel like nobody's ever going to bother us. And it's no big deal until it is. Until it is. So what do we do? I believe the answer is a spiritual awakening. We call it revival. But a spiritual awakening to the point where we give the gospel and see people saved. But what do we do during this time? Jesus told us, occupy till I come. That does not mean hold the fort for I am coming. That means take new territory and occupy that territory. And from there, set up a, 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 a I, I don't know the words for this, the military lingo, but uh, set up a, an army there that can go and branch from there and take over another area and set up another one there and take over another one there. That's the idea of occupy. It's not just sit still and do nothing and just, bless God, I'm going to be faithful till Jesus comes back. Be faithful, but do something. That's occupy, take more ground, occupy more ground, claim more territory for Christ, advance the gospel, and all the time be ready for the return of Christ for the rapture of the church. Yeah. Mm. Be ready for it. Say, so when's he coming back? I don't know. You know why I don't know? Jesus doesn't even know. By his own admission, only the Father knows. Just that thought. Just that thought can and should motivate us for what we're talking about. See, what if it gets so bad that we can't handle it? I don't know. I, I think it's kind of like the, the martyrs during the, the Inquisition. Inquisition, that, that was after the Protestant Reformation and they didn't like it, so they called it a counter-reformation. That was when they started burning people to stake and killing them and all this kind of thing for being Christians, having the word of God and so on. These people will be burned at the stake. They're burned alive at the stake. Crowd of people watching, sometimes their own family watching, sometimes his whole family's burned at the stake. And these people would cry out in England. They would cry out. They wouldn't curse. They wouldn't try to break free. But they, they, they were there. And they'd cry out, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. I don't know that I'd be saying that. I'd be more like, you let me off this post and I'll show you something. But they were crying, Lord, save the king of England. The one who gave me this sentence, save him. You know what that reminds me of? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Even in that moment, Jesus did not fret himself over evildoers. And that was pretty evil of what they did. I think we need to follow his example. Say, I'm struggling with that. Let me tell you a real quick secret how we can deal with this. 
this right here. There are some times this book is the only thing that will keep you sane. Right. In a world that has lost any mind that it had, this is the only book and the only thing that will keep you sane sometimes. Amen. So instead of just turning off things and getting rid of things, I would encourage you to do this. Fill your heart and mind with this book. And if you will fill your heart and mind, your life with this, it will flush out all the other stuff and there won't be room for it. Mm -hmm. That's good. I think that's some of the best advice I can give you on that. Advice is only as good as it's obeyed. You got to take it. Take this book and hide it in your heart. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. As you're standing to your feet, we're going to bow our head, close our eyes for a moment. Pray not that's up about evildoers, right? Amazing how quickly I get tempted with that. Lord, help us. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything, but just for just a second, I want you to just kind of calm your heart for a second. I don't know if anybody in this room is struggling with this kind of thing of being consumed with all the wickedness in the world and what's going to happen to our country and what's going to happen to our world and what are we down to? I mean, we're just, how far low, how low can we go with this? Uh, we haven't seen anything yet. What do we do? Well, it starts with our spirit and our attitude. Don't, don't fret about this. Don't, in, don't become envious and overzealous about this. Knowing their end, knowing God is in control, it'll help your spirit. You go into work and all they want to do is complain to you and talk about the, your, your higher-ups and your direct reports or whoever you have to talk to. And, and all they want to do is criticize those people and talk about it, complain about the situation. And you realize that's evil. Nobody, no, no person from Galilee Baptist Church should ever do that. Should never do that. Well, just know, just know they have no reward. But if Brother Rex pitched Sunday night, we sure have some coming if we're faithful to him. Amen. Don't partake of what they're doing. Heavenly Father, would you help us tonight as we meditate on these truths? I pray that you would help each one of us. In every situation in life, that we would not let our emotions and our flesh get the best of us in this way. Lord, it grieves my heart. It truly grieves me to hear of and see what's going on in our country. But Lord, I pray that we would not fill our minds by our ears and our eyes. We would not fill our hearts with our emotions and our thoughts about these things to the point where we, we get consumed with it and we get discouraged and even depressed by it. We become fearful. Lord, I truly believe there's more good going on than we realize because you are still at work. There is still a remnant of your people that believe in you and trust you and live for you. Lord, I believe that as long as that's going on, you're going to be working. I pray that we would keep our eyes focused, not just on positive thinking, but the work that God is doing in this place. May we be part of it. I pray you'd help each one of us. May our, may our mind be stayed upon you. May our thoughts be filled with Philippians 4, 8. And may we realize, Lord Jesus, that you are the fulfillment of all those things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. We'll see you Sunday.